This message comes from NPR sponsor ZoomInfo. Customer engagement used to be all nice restaurants and golf tea times. But with ZoomInfo, you can engage with the right customers across all channels from one platform. More at ZoomInfo.com. ZoomInfo, how business goes to market. Hello, hello. I'm Brittany Luce, and you're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR, a show about what's going on in culture and why it doesn't happen by accident. This weekend, we finally reached the moment we've all been waiting for. Or maybe the moment we've been waiting to end. The 96th Academy Awards, a.k.a. the Oscars. And the end of a very long award season. Now, I'm not going to sit here and act like I don't love movies. I mean, I even got a degree in film. And I love to see my favorite films and filmmakers of the year get the recognition they deserve. But while this year's Oscar-nominated films are some of the most exciting of the past few years, Oppenheimer, Past Lives, Anatomy of a Fall, so much of this award season has turned into opportunities for people to get mad. Just look at all the chatter about Barbie. For weeks, people have been whining that Margot Robbie and Greta Gerwig have been snubbed by the Academy, even though Barbie was nominated for eight awards, including Best Picture. Look, winning an Oscar is a big achievement and something that can change a filmmaker's life forever. But is our culture's focus on award seasons stifling our love of art more than celebrating it? NPR Pop Culture Happy Hour co-host Aisha Harris, who recently published an essay about this exact issue for NPR.org, joins the show to answer that question. Aisha, welcome back to It's Been a Minute. Hey, thanks for having me. Our pleasure, our pleasure. <sighs> Aisha, we're finally here. It's been months mm-hmm. and months. So many award shows, so many recurring stars, so many red carpets. It's become a super long content season. How are you holding up, Aisha? <laughs> I'm I'm glad we've made it to the final round. We are almost done. <laughs> and I'm ready to stop talking about awards. <laughs> But yeah, you know, it is part of my job. So I do still get some sort of pleasure out of it. It is fun to speculate and, you know, see some of my favorite performances and movies being honored and talked about more. So, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. it's it's a mixed bag, but I'm 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 ready to move on and prepare for the rest of this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we are tired, but but there's another feeling that it seems like a lot of people have when it comes to award season, and that is outrage. You wrote a whole essay about the outrage around these awards. What's up with it? I mean, look, the the Oscars and awards have always been fraught for many reasons. It's not like it's all of a sudden just become something that people complain about. But I do think, you know, there's a few kind of major factors that have contributed over the last several years to the sort of outrage that we've seen recently, including the infamous Dark Knight snub of it not getting a Best Picture nominee in 2009, which led to the Academy actually changing their rules so that they expanded the category from five to as many as 10 10 movies can be nominated. It varies how many do in any given year, but this year all 10 slots were taken. Which people have feelings about. Yeah. And so then you also have Oscar So White, that sort of industry push to get more inclusivity, diversity into the nominations. And on top of that, we've had like Me Too as well. So all those things I think have culminated to the big quote unquote outrage of this year, (laughs) which was Barbie, which Got eight nominations, by the way, including Best Picture, which it probably wouldn't have had The Dark Knight not sort of cracked that door open over a decade ago. But the big outrage was that uh, Greta Gerwig did not get nominated for Best Director and Margot Robbie did not get nominated for Best Actress. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it because I don't have a crystal ball, (laughs) but these girls have been nominated before. I guarantee they'll both be nominated again. Yeah. I guarantee. I guarantee. They are fine. They are, at this point, both so established that their place as like A-listers in Hollywood and people that we expect to see at award shows is now, I think, pretty solidly cemented. Right. You can feel however you want to feel, but it just feels a little misplaced 
to me, Very. the outrage feels misplaced to me, especially when I think about going back to the best director category. I think about someone like Celine Song, who wrote and directed mm. Past Lives, yeah. which is a movie I really loved. I know lots of other people really loved it too. It also was nominated for Best Picture. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> she's right there. This is a woman of color right there, right. Um, who's never been nominated before. Yes. Right there. Yes. Please talk to me more about your thoughts on this snub. Not just that it has been talked about and framed this way, but how it has been talked about and framed in this way. My question is like, how are we measuring success here? Because Barbie was the biggest movie of 2023. Like it worldwide box office, it crossed billion dollars. That is mm-hmm. one way to frame the success. And you mm-hmm. would think that could be enough. <laughs> But then, like, there's all this other added layer on top of it of the fact that it is Barbie. It's very Feminism 101, but, like, it it does have that. And so I think people felt as though box office is great and, like— that's that's amazing. It means women women can be in the audience, that they should be marketing to us more. And I get that. I get that aspect of this idea of progress. But then to throw on top of it, like, well, they weren't not in these specific categories. This is an affront to all women. It's like, well, <laughs> no, first of all, that's not how this works. <laughs> It's like that feminism back <laughs> 60 years. And that's how it was being framed. There, you know, like people were saying, well, how could you, like, Ryan Gosling was nominated? That just shows us that, like, exactly. And I'm like, no, the issue here is that we need to, A, just have more women being nominated in general, not just these mm-hmm, two mm-hmm, specific mm-hmm. women. And also, there is this like you said, misplaced energy where we are putting all of our ire and expectations of progress onto this very subjective ceremony Mm. where people Mm. have to campaign and basically pay to play in order to win. So true. So true. So true. So true. I think another way that this year's Oscar coverage feels a little bit too much and a little flat all at the same time in a positive way is the conversation around firsts. Mm. For example, there's Lily Gladstone, who is the first Native American person to be nominated in the Best Actress Acting Award category. But something about that kind of celebratory discourse, Mm. that can feel really flat as well. Yes, Um, (laughs) It doesn't hit for me in the same way it did maybe when I was 14 and crying over Halle Berry winning that Best Actress Award back in, you know, 2002. Yeah. I think we're kind of on the same page here. I would love to see Lily Gladstone become the first Native American. She's not the first Indigenous person because there there have been Indigenous acting nominees previously, but first Indigenous American. And I think I would love to see that happen. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. But I also think we can get a little too in the weeds sometimes or be too reliant on those firsts because Halle Berry... <laughs> was the first. And 20 years later, she still is the only one. And that is why I think, again, putting so much of our hopes into these awards is not really what we should be doing. I think the other thing that I find really frustrating about these firsts is that like, once we get these firsts, then we have to keep like making them ever more specific and like kind of arbitrary. Like apparently America (laughs) Ferrera is the first Honduran performer to be nominated for an Oscar ever. And I'm like, I mean, I mean, I'm happy for her. I think that's a wonderful accomplishment. I would feel that myself if I were her, like proud to be Honduran. However, I see what you're saying. It feels like Hollywood is always trying to give themselves a win with a new first, even if they have to get like super specific about it. I mean, this is not necessarily the same thing, but I saw something the other, a TikTok the other day talking about a popular influencer being the first Black influencer to have a smoothie collaboration with Erewhon, <laughs> like the very expensive grocery store chain yes. in Los Angeles. And I was thinking like, let's take a step back. Let's yes, put that, down that the is, phone. To, that to me is the biggest. I do think at a certain point we have to be like, okay, why do we have to keep having these first? And also like, why are these first still first to begin with? <laughs> Like, we have to unpack all of that because, you know, we're talking about first in terms of, like, you're breaking a barrier of, of, of some sort. But it's like, yeah. okay, but let's talk about those actual barriers yes, and the what they are. And to me, that's less of an accomplishment than just, like, 
either a fluke of timing or finally these people are a little bit less bigoted (laughs) than they were before. Yeah, well, I mean, to me, it's like I feel happy for the artist that receives, you know, the recognition. However, the conversation entirely centers around (laughs) <laughs> how happy we all should be that this is finally happening, as opposed yeah. to, as you say, actually shaming <laughs> these organizations, <laughs> like, like literal exactly. shaming. I think that there are definitely ways to shame these organizations <laughs> and to shame Hollywood as an industry and as an institution, while also maintaining that celebratory tone for the performers and artists and creators who deserve it. In your essay, you brought up the economy of prestige and talking about evaluating art. What did you learn from that? Yeah, so that's uh, James F. English. He wrote an entire book that's really fascinating, and it's came out almost 20 years ago, but it's still so relevant. He really sort of contextualized the idea of awards, cultural prizes with the Pulitzer and the Nobel Literature mm-hmm, Prize, mm-hmm. like how those really establish this like way of measuring art and turning it into like a spectator sport. Hmm. And and also it's really interesting to read the book and sort of see how he's like, so the Nobel Literature Prize came along in like the early 1900s and then everyone started creating prizes for their respective countries and fields. Now we have advertising awards. Now there are yes. awards for awards. Like, did you know that, you know? What? So the Tonys has won like a, Emmys. an Emmy. Yes, Emmys because right, for, for like production. production. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> So it's like, there's like the fact that, you know, there are awards for awards. When you think about the way that these things all function, it's like, we are definitely part of the problem, you and I, in that like, it's there's this entire ecosystem of the Oscars or any award season where you have the awards, you have the people campaigning for the awards, and then you have the media who are writing about it. They are doing the interviews. They're doing the actors' roundtables, you know. And then on top of that, they're also trying to place bets on who's going to win and whose stock is rising and whose stock is currently falling. It is in many ways kind of a spectator sport. And especially this year when you're thinking about Barbie and Oppenheimer and how those two films are now just like forever linked, both like (laughs) literally and spiritually together in the minds of everyone this whole showdown is being put up as like it's between these two movies that is sort of the thing that people are excited about and that's what makes it this sort of thing that we all have our teams that we're rooting for how does one actually evaluate art how do we actually recognize and acknowledge and determine what is good or brave or innovative? I think that is the eternal question. And I think it's definitely fluctuated, especially with the proliferation of social media and just all these different ways to measure who's watching what, who's reading what, who's listening to what. You know, I think the way that we are currently doing it now, as you said, it's like awards, it's box office, and it's streaming numbers if streaming sites will give us those numbers. <laughs> they they often will not. Um, so that's like wrapped up in its own. But then there's also, you know, this idea of stands and people being fans of celebrities and being fans of franchises. Even if, you know, a movie doesn't necessarily do great at the box office, you could try and measure it in like engagement on social media or, mm. you know, mm. Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> Throwback. You know, those sorts of things. Mm. I think, you know, putting too much stock in awards is kind of boring. It doesn't lead us anywhere. (sighs) Well, I mean, you know, what's funny is like I complain, but I watch all these movies. And then, of course, even if I don't watch the telecast, what am I doing? I'm looking at my phone, (laughs) getting up the next day to find out who won what. It's something that I still want to know, no matter how strange and screwed up this whole system might be. I'm still nosy. I'm part of the problem, Aisha. Uh, You and me both. Look, this is my (laughs) Super Bowl. Even if my teams do not get nominated, I'm still going to be watching. I think I've only missed one Oscar telecast in the last like 20 years. Oh my gosh. Well, Aisha, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me about this. It has been a joy. It's always a joy with you, Brittany. Thank you. Thanks again to Aisha Harris. Her essay, Award Shows Have Become Outrage Generators, Surely There Is Another Way, is available on npr.org right now. Stick around. 
because one listener wants to know my thoughts on who should take home an Oscar, and I've got opinions. But first, politicians and economists keep telling us the economy is doing well. But why doesn't it feel that way? The following message comes from NPR sponsor Sattva. Founder and CEO Ron Rudson is on a mission to bring quality sleep to more people. Health and wellness are so tied to quality sleep. And I'm trying to tell everyone, look, you have to treat sleep like an activity. Because I believe sleep is the most important thing in your life. To learn more, go to SAATVA.com slash NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor Morgan Stanley. Inclusion is fuel for innovation. On Access and Opportunity, an award-winning show from Morgan Stanley, they take you inside the companies at the intersection of building equity for their communities and creating business solutions in overlooked areas of the market, from closing the women's sports pay gap to leveling the playing field in the music industry. Follow Access and Opportunity wherever you listen. This message is brought to you by Apple Pay. Fussing with plastic cards should be a thing of the past. Instead, pay the Apple way. Apple Pay is easy, secure, and built into iPhone. All you have to do is set it up. Just add a card in the Wallet app and you're good to go. Support for NPR comes from FX with Shogun, an original series based on the novel by James Clavell. FX's Shogun is an epic saga of war, passion, and power set in feudal Japan, starring Hiroyuki Sanada and Anna Sawai. Now streaming on Hulu. I want to tell you a little story. A few weeks ago, I went to the grocery store and I saw that eggs were $12. That is a dollar, one dollar per egg. Turns out it was not an egg buying day for me. But then a little bit later, I'm reading about politicians and economists who are shouting about how the economy is doing amazing. Wages are up more than prices. Unemployment has reached historic lows. Families are finally getting a little breathing room. And for me, that felt a little something like whiplash. And the thing is, this whiplash keeps happening. I'm always feeling strains on my wallet, small and big. I keep wondering, am I ever even going to be able to afford to buy a house? And then I turn around and yet again, bam, there's an economist or politician telling me about how great the economy is doing. We really are in a much better place than I think anybody had expected. We continue to see lots of good news in terms of employment and wage growth and savings. Inflation has definitely done better than any of us thought. The economy has remained stronger. So my question today, is the economy actually doing well? According to what and who? And if so, why does it feel so bad? Lucky for me, my guest today is Darian Woods, co-host from The Indicator from Planet Money. On the show, he gives daily insight to the stories behind the economic indicators we encounter going about our lives. Also, fun fact, he's a former advisor to the Secretary of the New Zealand Treasury. Anyway, buckle up, because we're getting into the big feelings behind the numbers. Darian, welcome to It's Been a Minute. Hey, lovely to be here. It's good to have you. It's good to have you. Okay, so I want to get right into it. Though many everyday people are feeling down on the economy. American economists keep asserting that our economy is doing good. What indicators are economists using to come to that conclusion? Yes, it's it's kind of funny. Like, be happy, guys. Come on. That seems yeah. to be the message. It's like Sometimes it's how it feels. <laughs> yeah. But look, there are certain indicators that are looking pretty good. Things like unemployment. It's been consistently under 4% for a while. That's historically Mm -hmm. really good. Mm -hmm. Things like inflation coming down from its highs a couple of years ago. Now it's running at around 3%, which is Mm -hmm. close to what we would hope for. So there are certain measures that look good. And so it has been this puzzle about why Americans are feeling not so hot about the economy. Hmm. There's this wonderfully named index called the Misery Index. It's great, (laughs) not just because of its name, but also because of how simple it is. You just add in inflation to unemployment. And the higher the numbers here, the worse things are. And so misery should be low, but yet people are consistently saying that they're not feeling so great about the economy. Just recently, Siena College Research Institute and the New York Times surveyed American voters. 
a majority, 51%, said they thought the economy is doing poorly. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. If the economy is doing so good, why do so many people talk about it like it's so bad? This is a really interesting question. And and nobody knows the exact reason, but there are, are a bunch of theories. Uh, would you like me to go through these theories? Please do. All right. So theory number one, the high cost of borrowing. So the interest rates are pretty high right now. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to borrow money to buy a car, even if you have very good credit, the interest rate on a new car could be around 8%. Before the I pandemic, see. that was around 4.5%. So your monthly payments are going to be way higher. Yeah. Economists from Harvard and the International Monetary Fund recently released a working paper that looked at high interest rates, and they conclude that Three quarters of this disconnect between, I guess, economists and the public is because of the high cost of borrowing. Hmm. That makes sense because like people borrow money to pay for big things yep. like education, cars, homes. You know, those are the big ticket items, I guess you would say. Yeah. And they're like the milestones for how we're going through life. And and that leads us to theory number two, which is the high cost of housing. House prices are now about 45% higher than they were before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But you've got hourly earnings in the private sector. They're only up about 20%. So they're not keeping up with higher house prices. And mm. then you add on top of that interest payments. Now we have the situation where the typical monthly payment for a new mortgage is roughly double what it was pre-pandemic. Ah, I'm sorry, I had to keep myself from full on screaming into the microphone. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is, that is really, I mean, thanks. I mean, I don't have a house and, and I agree. I mean, the thing is, is like, I, I have felt like it's looking pretty bad for me, like the interest rates and also specifically the cost of housing. I mean, those are two things that people feel. When we talk about the felt experience of the economy. I think those two things feel particularly sticky for people when they're like, okay, you say the economy is good, but I can't afford to buy a house. I've seen this, this explanation as well, that we've had really high inflation in a rate that was way too high for anybody to think it was good for the economy. And now that's back down to normal levels. But there is a theory out there, and, and this has actually been tested using some of the data by uh, two Stanford economists, mm -hmm. that we're still shocked by these high prices at the supermarket or at the gas station or wherever. And it takes about 18 months to two years to kind of really just get used to this new price that we're seeing everywhere, even if our incomes have, have lifted to kind of hmm. meet those higher prices. I mean, I suppose I can understand that. Like, there's just a gradual sticker shock that follows you mm. for the rest of your life as prices increase for everyday items and things that you use all the time. Okay, so going back to this misery index, it seems to be missing a lot of indicators that I feel really huge to me. I have thoughts on this. But what other indicators do you think could better reflect the felt experience of the economy? Absolutely. And so no two indicators are going to give you the state of the economy. And that's why we have a daily podcast, because there are so many other things. <laughs> we really care a lot about the labor market. And the labor market is not just the unemployment rate. And so it's also participation, how many people are participating in the labor market. And actually, for 25 to 54 year olds, it's hovering around near record highs. Mm. Um, you also want to break it down by race and by different education levels. And the labor market is actually doing really well. And obviously, these are averages. And we have heard from people on our show as well who say, I'm not feeling this hot economy. I've been looking for a job for the last nine months. Right. And that those stories are absolutely true. And, and that's one problem with using averages. There are also sectors that are doing worse for each other. And so while the averages are looking fantastic, it masks some of the variation. The misery index will always be such a partial explanation, which is why we look at a range of indicators. Okay, so economists have an overall positive outlook at the economy. And yet I've noticed a sort of general skepticism in the media, kind of, you know, doubting the quote unquote good economy. I wonder if part of that is because of the lived experiences journalists gather in their work and, and that, you know, they may have some insight into the varied experiences of Americans that economists may not be considering. But 
But what do you make of that? Yeah, so two researchers wrote this paper looking at the sentiment of economic news in the U.S. Sure. Going back many, many decades, actually. And, and they found that, you know, what used to happen was that the better the economy was, the happier were the reports in, in the newspapers. Uh-huh. Since 2018, they noticed a break and the newspapers were consistently more negative than what the economic numbers would suggest. So places like the Washington Post were writing economic reports that were kind of negative. And and, and 2018 is kind of a mysterious year. I mean, it wasn't a presidential election year. No. I don't recall any major new social media innovations at the time, but this is a trend that's been found by both this paper and other researchers as well. And whether that is causing the public to be more negative or the journalists, as you say, are part of the public and are noticing something that the numbers are not noticing, I don't know. Another thing I want to talk about, there was this interesting poll that I found. Last summer, this poll found a majority of respondents thought the economy was in bad shape. And at the same time, the majority of respondents also said their own personal finances were good. I just think that it's very interesting how those two answers can coexist. It's so interesting. I think this comes down to the negativity of social media, mainstream media, and and politicization. Because huh. I, I can't think of many other explanations where... A lot of people are saying, my finances are good, but everybody else's are bad, other than the stories they're being told. Now, one potential explanation is that people are worried about the future. Maybe things are good for now, but things Hmm. might get worse. They might wonder if the other shoe is going to drop at some point. I wonder how much precarity factors into that polling data. Even just me personally, I can feel good about where I'm Hmm. at now, but that could shift greatly once I have children. Yeah. Could some of that precarity also be at play when we look at polls that show these kind of almost like counterintuitive ideas? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I I haven't seen any hard data on this, but there there has to be an effect from seeing your families and neighbors set up GoFundMes for health emergencies or your own experience, whether it was losing your job in the pandemic or whether it was struggling to find a job out of college. And so, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Speaking of perception, as a millennial, I was shocked to see a headline recently that millennials are on track to become the richest generation in history. But much of that wealth is going to be from inheritance. How do you think about this in regards to the quote unquote good economy situation? It's a really interesting headline. And I think about maybe a millennial might say, It's so much harder to buy a house now than it was for my parents. And then now we're seeing, you know, sadly, parents have have an expiry date. And that means that potentially they may be getting that house. Hmm. Of course, there are millennials whose parents don't own houses. uh, And and those millennials won't receive that housing wealth. Mm -hmm. We have seen signs that millennials are actually having greater degrees of inequality and wealth within the generation. And so... Even though the the generation may be wealthier Mm -hmm. than previous generations, it may not be shared equally. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that was some of my thinking when when I read that. Like, it's perhaps not the indication of like a good economy or a more prosperous future, but a continuation of inequality passed down through generations that begins to almost concentrate more. Potentially, potentially. Hmm. Pulling out a little bit, who benefits from our economy being framed as good or bad? Mm. Well, I think the incumbent politicians certainly benefit from the economy (laughs) being framed as good. And so I think this is actually a real issue for the Democratic Party leading into the presidential election is how do we either communicate or recognize or promote the economy as being good? Mm. I think this is a, a real matter of puzzlement inside the White House. In fact, one of the authors of that piece around how the media is becoming more negative uh, around the economy was actually a, a former assistant secretary to the Treasury under Biden up until last year. I mean, I've also heard that your perception of the economy is determined by what political party you're aligned with. Totally. So 
we're getting more polarized. That's not <laughs> news to anybody. But that is meaning that it's kind of irrelevant for a lot of people what is actually happening with jobs, with incomes, and that kind of thing. It's really just about who's the president or who's in Congress. And so there will be a segment that just can't be uh, influenced either way. But I will say, I, I don't think it's going to be the defining issue in the way that it has perhaps in previous elections. So 1992 presidential election for Bill Clinton famously had the catchphrase behind the scenes, uh, is the economy stupid? <laughs> what? As in, don't bother with all the other issues and topics and don't waste your time. Just tell them that you're going to make a better economy. <laughs> it's the economy. You're going to give people jobs. You're going to make people feel richer. Wow. That's what people care about. I don't think wow. that's the major thing in this election. It's a, certainly a big part, but there are other issues like abortion, reproductive rights. There are issues like wars and conflicts around the world. And so I think some of these other issues are also going to be super critical and, and the economy will just be one of many. Darian, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me about this today. Thanks, Brittany. Fascinating chat. That was Darian Woods, co-host of The Indicator from Planet Money. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Discover. Debit card users, Discover has something especially for you. With Discover Cashback Debit, everyone can start earning cash back on everyday debit card purchases. That's right, cash back on debit purchases because cash back isn't just for credit cards. Plus, there are no fees, period. Finally, the game-changing checking account you deserve. Check out transaction eligibility and terms at discover.com slash cashbackdebit. Discover Bank. Member FDIC. This message comes from NPR sponsor REI Co-op. REI has gear, clothing, classes, and advice for camping and glamping, biking and hiking, axing and snacksing, backpacking, and another outdoor thing that rhymes with backpacking. Visit your local REI co-op or REI.com for the million and one ways you can opt outside. Support for NPR and the following message come from Rosetta Stone, the perfect app to achieve your language learning goals no matter how busy your schedule gets. It's designed to maximize study time with immersive 10-minute lessons and audio practice for your commute. Plus, tailor your learning plan for specific objectives like travel. Get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off and unlimited access to 25 language courses. Learn more at rosettastone.com slash NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message come from UCSF Health. The human brain is both remarkable and complex. The neurological specialists at UC San Francisco are constantly thinking of new and better ways to treat it. More at ucsfhealth.org slash great minds. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. It's Ben. This year I got really into the Oscar-nominated shorts, and I really want this one from Denmark about death to win. <laughs> I'm just wondering if there's any Oscar nominations that you really think should win. Hey, Ben. Thank you so much for calling in with such a timely question. Oh, my gosh. It is Oscar weekend. And everybody is going on and on about their odds and the picks and who's likely to win and so on and so forth. And I just want to throw my little hat into the ring. I like to go by who's the winner in my heart. So first of all, I want to talk about the Best Actress Award. There are so many fabulous nominees. And in this category, I have a pick and a half. Now, my pick is Lily Gladstone. I thought that her performance in Killers of the Flower Moon was unbelievable. But then my half, my half is Annette Bening. I'm going to be honest with you. I have not seen Naya, the film that Annette Bening was nominated for. But what I did see was 20th Century Women, which came out a few years ago. And Annette Bening was not nominated for that, and she did not win for that. That is one of the finest performances I've ever seen in my entire life in the history of cinema. And I condemn the Academy Awards for not recognizing Annette Bening operating at what I believe, like I said, I haven't seen Nyad yet, but what I believe is her peak. Another category where I also am feeling a lot of emotion right now is the best animated feature. 
Recently, I have become obsessed with the films of one Hayao Miyazaki, and I, like many people, went to see The Boy and the Heron in theaters this year. I just have to say, he did a beautiful, gorgeous job with that film. I was crying. It had me in a complete emotional twist. I know everybody's all Spider-Verse this, Spider-Verse that. I saw Elemental and I cried. I saw Nimona and I cried. And I'm happy for you all, but we need to respect the master. So in the best animated feature category, I want to see Hayao Miyazaki. And one more thing. I know this is not at all what you asked. And this film isn't nominated for anything. But what I think should be right up there for best picture is John Wick 4. It was one of the most perfect films I saw all year and the only movie, the only movie that I saw this year that I gave five stars in my letterbox. So I just want to say I'm already campaigning John Wick 5 Best Picture nominee at possibly the 2027 Academy Awards. So just something to think about, throwing it out there. Anyway, those are my thoughts and feelings. I hope you have a great weekend and thank you so much, Ben, again for calling in with this question. If you have a thought or question about pop culture, send us a voice memo at ibam at npr.org. That's I-B-A-M at npr.org. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Barton Girdwood, Alexis Williams, Liam McBain, Corey Antonio Rose. This episode was edited by Jessica Placzek. Engineering support came from Phil Edfors. Becky Brown. We have fact-checking help from Greta Pittenger. Our executive producer is Verilyn Williams. Our VP of programming is Yolanda Sanguini. All right, that's all for this episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce. Talk soon. This message comes from NPR sponsor Capella University. With Capella's FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree online at your own pace and get support from people who care about your success. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This message comes from NPR sponsor Rosetta Stone, an expert in language learning for 30 years. Right now, NPR listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership to 25 different languages for 50% off. Learn more at rosettastone.com NPR. It's Oscar season, and we watched the nominated movies so you don't have to. We are making some bold predictions for Hollywood's biggest night, and we may just help you win your Oscars pool. Listen to NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour podcast.